start service this morning. We're glad you're here in the building and glad you're here online with us. If y'all stand and sing with us. This morning we're going to talk a lot about the supremacy of Christ, about how he is overall, through all, everything was made by him, for him, by him. So let's sing Indescribable right now. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea. seated. All right, thank you all for joining us this morning. We're so glad you guys are here. So welcome, 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 whether you're in-house or if you join us online. Uh, so it's just great to see you. Amen. Amen. Hey, all right, so as you came in this morning, you should have got something that looks like this. This is our worship guide. So if you open it up, there's some announcements and some different things in there. I'll come back to that here in a second. But first, I want to talk to you about this card here, which is in the seat back in front of you, or it is online, and there's a QR code. should be above my head here or somewhere around me. Uh, so if you are online, click on that thing, uh, and it'll take you to what everything you need for Sunday morning. Uh, so it'll be our, our 
connection card is on there. Our worship guide is on there. Um, so if you if you guys came in and you missed that, you can click on that thing there and get all that stuff for you. But if you came in this morning and you are a guest with us for the first time or you're a guest with us the hundredth time, we want you to fill this connection card out because we want to connect with you. Uh, also on the back side of that, if you guys are here and you need prayer, put that on there because we want to pray for you. Uh, whatever you have going on in your life, uh, whatever you have going on in your family's life, please put those on there. We'd love to pray for you guys. All right, so let's come back to this bad boy. All right, this is our worship guide. If you open up, there is some announcements in there. Lots of announcements that I'm not going to cover, but some that I am. Uh, and so today, today, Church on Purpose, tonight here at 4. So come back tonight. Yep, so Joel Bratcher from the BSM is going to be here tonight to talk to us uh, and give us information about how we can partner with them to reach international students here in Bryan College Station. So we have a ton of international students that come in, families that come from all over, uh, students that come from all over, a way to reach them so we can partner with the BSM. Now also too, in your worship guide, so specifically on this one, this is what I want you to do. Okay, on the inside here, it says there's a new member class and it says that it's supposed to be next week. Okay, what I want you to do is take your pen out right now, go and scratch out that date and that time and put T. BD because we have to postpone it. So we don't have new member class next week. So if you're planning on coming and you signed up already, just know we're going to delay that a little bit. We'll let you know when that's going to occur. Okay. So uh, I think that's all that I have today, right? Is that it? No, I forgot. One of the best things ever. So, and I really wish we would have had this like recorded to where it said, Sunday, 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 because Sunday, Sunday's coming in a couple weeks. So we're going to do some ice cream up here uh, in the evening. So come make sure you put that on your counter. So you come back. Uh, if you were joining us online, maybe we'll set something up for you so you can eat a bowl of ice cream at your house with us at the same time. But also too, part of Sunday, Sunday is this. Okay, some of you guys like to make homemade ice cream and some of you guys like to eat homemade ice cream. So we need both people to show up. If you like to make homemade ice cream, we're having a homemade ice cream contest. Okay, so you'll be able to find that link through our website. You'll also be able to sign up for that piece to say, hey, I want to bring some homemade ice cream. I want to be in the contest. Okay, that also means everybody else who likes to eat homemade ice cream, you need to show up and eat homemade ice cream and taste test it and tell us who the winner is. But we'll also have some other ice cream too. So if you don't like homemade ice cream, we'll have store-bought ice cream too. So we'll, we'll cover everybody. Okay, unless you just don't like ice cream, then show up anyways because we'll be able to hang out and fellowship with each other. All right, that's all I got for you guys this morning. Welcome to Living Hope. I think, uh... I think that's it. That's it. That's it. I'm done. I love ice cream suppers. I met my wife at an ice cream supper one time. 27 years ago. Yeah. I know. We don't look that old. Um, yeah. Y'all stand and sing some more with us. We're still going to sing about Jesus and uh, how great he is, how high he is. How wonderful he is, how marvelous he is. Uh, I found there's, a, there's an old hymn, it's Im Immortal, Invisible. Uh, we sing it a little different than the old hymn, but it's from 1 Timothy 1.17. I'm going to start with verse 16 here. It says, Paul is talking to Timothy here. He says, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul had some long run on sentences. If you read what he's writing, um, if you read a lot of the New Testament, he just continues to go and he gets excited about the immortal, invisible Jesus and God and just how great he is. And it's just funny kind of watching how he writes there. So anyway, y'all sing this song with us. more 
Father, we love you and we thank you for who you are. Uh, truly, you're good. And if we were honest, we have no right uh, to come before you and worship you, God, uh, because of what we've done, because of who we are, but by your grace and who you are. We come before you today and we worship you as king. We worship you as Lord of lords. God, you are good in every way. Uh, you are everything. And so I pray today that as we we learn and grow together, God, that, that you would help us see you a little clearer. I know we're never, ever going to understand you perfectly until we actually stand in front of you. But God, help us see a glimpse. Help us have a hint of how powerful you are, how amazing you are, and how loving you are. God, how forgiving you are, how gracious. And we thank you for your son who paid for us, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, you can have a seat. 
children, kinder first and second, right out that door over there to children's worship. Everybody else, not everybody else, adults stay here. <laughs> Fusion upstairs. Cool, cool. Hey, uh, real quick, uh, you may have noticed, I don't know if you noticed, uh, but, but Alan is not here right now. Uh, he, I'm sure most of you missed him out in the hall and you get used to seeing him jump around up here and be ready and stuff. Uh, we're missing him today because he loves us very much. It's why we're missing him today. Uh, Alan got exposed this last week to COVID and, uh, just like he's been throughout this entire thing, he's been very cautious and said, Hey man, it would break my heart if I gave this to anybody or it was me that made somebody sick that I love so much. And so he chose to quarantine today. But what he did do is he took yesterday, which is supposed to be his day off, and he went ahead and recorded the sermon for us. And so we're going to sit and we're going to watch a sermon. Uh, I already did that. <laughs> we're going we're to watch a sermon together. Uh, it, it should be pretty amazing. I know what Alan's preaching on. And if we would just get a glimpse of it, I believe it would change our lives. So uh, sit back. And check this out. Good morning, everybody. If I have not had a chance to meet you, I am Alan. I'm the pastor here and one of the elders. Um, I'm going to say welcome to everybody. Every Sunday morning for the last several weeks, I've been saying welcome to our worship service, whether you are at home or whether you're here in the building. And so today I have a unique opportunity to say welcome to those for at home, just like I am. Uh, as you heard a moment ago, I am under quarantine right now, and so I've invited you into uh, this place, my bedroom, where I'm quarantining. Pray for me and pray for our family. Pray for Ashley. She kind of manages the household while I'm under quarantine. Pray that we all stay healthy and safe and all that good stuff. So anyway, we are thrilled that you're with us today and, uh, and that I have an opportunity to preach to you um, via technology, although I wish I was there in the building with you. Today, we start a new series called The Supremacy of Christ, and, and it's going to walk us uh, through a bit of Colossians, and then in a couple of weeks, it'll walk us through a portion of the book of Hebrews as well. We'll see about who Christ is and how he is supreme in all things. I hope that you have your worship guide handy, whether you're there in the building or whether you're joining online. On those worship uh, guides, there's a place where it shows where we are in our reading plan for the year, and then also um, uh, the sermon notes for this morning. So we're going to be looking today at Colossians chapter 1. So I hope that if you've got a Bible, you'll open it. If you don't have a Bible and you're in the building, there should be one inside, uh, I'm sorry, under your seat or a seat near you where you can grab a Bible and follow along with us. If you need to look in the table of contents to find the book of Colossians, that's fine as well. As we get started this morning, I want to kind of take you back 35 years. Um, it was 1986, and the White House Wildcats went into the Lindell Eagles basketball gym, and I'm proud to say that we came out number one. I mean, we came out with bragging rights because we were the middle school basketball district champs, and we could rightly say that we were number one. And perhaps you've heard that cheer before, that chant, we're number one, we're number one. That kind of thing was going on. We were so excited to get back to uh, our gym because our coaches didn't let us celebrate properly. We wanted to cut down the nets, but they wouldn't let us do that in Lindell. So we went into the dark of our own gym there in White House and walked into the gym and cut down the nets. And there was a guy or two that cut his hand while he was doing it. But we just knew that was the proper way to celebrate being number one. As I share that, there's nothing wrong with us celebrating our achievements and celebrating the fact that we have had success. But in the midst of everything that we have going on in our life, whether it's a basketball championship or otherwise, let's never forget who truly is number one. And, and that's the passage we're going to look at this morning to see who is truly number one. You see, the Apostle Paul was writing this letter to a church in the city or town of Colossae. He, he didn't start this church, but he knew the folks that were a part of that church, and he knew that there was some uh, false teachings going on. And so he wrote this letter to them to point them to the truth about who Jesus is so that he could clear up some of this false teaching. I would invite you to join me by reading Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20 this morning. Here's what it says. He is, and you need to know that if you go back to verse 13, we see that the he there is the beloved son of the father. So this is Jesus Christ when it says he. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, 
the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. What I want to share with you this morning is kind of the background of what's going on. As I mentioned, Paul is writing this to address some false teachings, some, some very uh, big, important false teachings that he needed to correct um, about who Jesus is. Uh, false teachings are referred to as heresy, and this heresy that he's addressing, we don't really know all of the particulars about it, but we do know that this heresy was questioning Jesus' divinity. There's a lot of speculation over what the heresy is, uh, but the reality is that that it's most likely, in my opinion, an early version of what would come to be known as Gnosticism. Uh, the word gnosis comes from the word, the Greek word, that is the Greek word, I mean, for knowledge. And, and the Gnostics believed a few things that would be completely wrong. And for you to understand what this passage is saying, we need to understand who the Gnostics were. Four things I want to share with you about uh, Gnosticism. Number one, they believe that all matter uh, is evil. And so therefore, God could not have created the world, but instead, something they would refer to as an emanation did. And it's the idea that God created something that created something that created something that created something that were less than God, that kind of was a special being, an, an angelic being, if you will, an in intermediary of sorts, but that God himself did not really create the world, that one of these emanations of God did. The second thing that Gnostics would believe is, is about Jesus. They would think that Jesus was not the unique son of God, but instead he was one of these I I emanations, one of these intermediaries. Perhaps he was the most important created being of God, but that he was not God himself. The third thing that you need to know about Gnostics is that they believe that it, because of the to other beliefs that it's impossible for God to have come to the earth as a human in bodily form, and therefore Jesus was not God. And all of these things being the, the case for the Gnostics, the fourth thing is that Jesus is not the center of our salvation, but then instead for us to have salvation, we have to climb a ladder of sorts to get to God, to get through all of these emanations of God, and that we need a special gnosis or a special knowledge. And so as you can see, this was a messed up belief system about Jesus. And so here's Paul writing this early, uh, the beginning part of this book of Colossians as a bit of a hymn, if you will, uh, a song or a poem or, or a right teaching about who Jesus Christ really is in order that he would correct these heresies that they were experiencing. So that being said, let us look at what this text teaches us to see who Jesus really is, and we'll see that Jesus really is to be first in all things. Now, on your notes, you see the first note says this, that Jesus is preeminent in all things. I took that phrase directly from Scripture. Look down in verse 18 at the end of it. It says that in everything, Jesus might be preeminent. So we need to understand that Jesus is preeminent. What does preeminent mean? The, the Greek word here, and sometimes I don't pronounce them correctly, but the Greek word here is proteuo, and the you may hear the P-R-O at the beginning, proto, which is first or beginning. The idea of preeminent is one who holds a first place or a first position. And so Jesus literally is first in all things. Perhaps you noticed the word all was in the, the passage quite a few times. Uh, the word all is found there, or, or a variation of the word all. For instance, in verse 18, it says everything, but the Greek word is the same. The Greek word is pas, P-A-S, a, a version of that, that word. And that word is used eight times in these verses. And so there is a heavy emphasis, the fact that Jesus is above or in first place over all things. It says that eight different times. And along the lines of preeminence, we see five other occasions where there's an emphasis on the word first or beginning or before. And so we see that Jesus is truly above everything else. So why is it or how is it that Jesus is preeminent in all things? This is kind of the baseline of the next three points that you'll see. We have to begin here understanding that Paul is laying out an argument that Jesus is above all 
things. Here's why he's above all things. First of all, you'll see there on your notes, is that Jesus is fully God. I mean, that's the only way that he can be first in all things if, is, is if he is God himself. And, and so, as I said a moment ago, the heresy that these Colossians were believing or hearing about was that Jesus was not truly God, and Paul corrects that uh, that incorrect teaching, that that heresy, by telling them or reminding them that Jesus truly is God himself. I mean, he begins right there in verse 15. Here's what it says at the beginning. It says that Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God. The word image here is the Greek word icon. Uh, it's like the word we would think of in English, icon, but it, it, it means representation or manifestation. And so in this sense, when it says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, it's indicating that Jesus is the representation or the revelation and the manifestation of God himself. But what we mean by a representation of God is that Jesus is our ability to see and know and understand God at the best of our ability. Because we have to remember that Jesus is the image of the invisible God and that because God is invisible, it's going to be hard for us as humans in our finite mind to fully and truly understand him. But Jesus is a full, accurate, complete representation of God. Why is that? because he is God. Look at, or maybe you, you won't take the time to, to glance uh, at this verse, but consider this verse found in the book of John. John chapter one, verse 18. In verses one through 18, uh, John at the beginning of his uh, gospel really spells out who Jesus is and describes him as the word of God and how he was with God and how he created everything. And we'll get to that in a moment. But in verse 18, it says this, no one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. So John tells us that the one who makes God known to us is the one who is God himself at the Father's side. It is Jesus Christ. No one has seen the Father, but Jesus came in order that we might see him, understand him, and get to know him. And so Jesus, in this sense, is the image of the invisible God. But he's not just an image. He's not just a snapshot. He's not just a picture. He's not just a representation. He's not just some kind of like um, model, if you will, of God. He is God himself. And therefore, Jesus is the manifestation of God. In other words, Jesus is God, and he literally took on flesh, and he dwelled among us. John chapter 1 talks about that quite a bit, and perhaps you'll go back later today and read the beginning of John chapter 1. But we see in all of this that Jesus is God himself. He is God incarnate, meaning that he is God taking on flesh. Now, I know this is hard to fully understand in our finite minds. How can God put on flesh, and how could a man be fully God? And yet, with Jesus, he was 100% God and 100% man, and so God came to us in the Son of God, Jesus, as our representation or image of God. I want you to also look down in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, and it talks about Jesus here, and it says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. I want us to focus on this word fullness. The fullness here means total quality or completeness. I'm sorry, completeness. And so in that sense, that Jesus is not less than God, he is God. You see, the heresy, the, the teachings, the Gnostics would say, oh, Jesus was just one of many emanations that God sent forth. But Jesus is not just an emanation or an intermediary. Instead, he is God himself. And Paul makes it crystal clear because he says that the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus. So we see in Jesus that he is completely God, and because of that, he is the full and final revelation of God, and nothing more is ever necessary. I want you to consider another passage of Scripture. I mentioned the book of Hebrews a moment ago that when we get to Hebrews, it'll be a part of this same series where we're looking at the supremacy of Christ, but I want, us to, want you to hear Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. It's talking about Jesus and it says that Jesus, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by his word 
of, sorry, by the word of his power. It says that Jesus is the exact impress of God because Jesus is God. So we see in this passage, as well as all throughout Scripture, that the Bible teaches us about the Trinity. And perhaps you've heard of the Trinity. I hope that you have. Because to understand God, we have to understand that he is a triune God. He is Trinity. He is one God. And yet we experience him in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we refer to him as the Trinity or the triune God. Uh, we're a part of the Baptist, uh, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, and and as a result of that, we we subscribe to what is referred to as the Baptist faith and message, and and I like how it phrases this sentence about who God is and how God is revealed to us as the Triune God. It says this: the eternal Triune God reveals Himself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with distinct personal attributes, but without division of nature, essence, or being. In other words, we worship one God, and yet we experience him in the three persons of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who are all three co-eternal and co-equal in their essence, in their will, and in their power, because they are one. So, this is the beginning point for us to understand that Jesus is preeminent above everything else because he is God. And as God, that automatically makes him above and superior to everything else. As God, we see on your notes that he created everything. That's the next note on your sermon notes. He created everything. Look down in verse 16. It says, for by him, meaning Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. You cannot read that sentence and walk away and understand other anything other than the fact that Jesus, as God, fully created everything. There's three different prepositions that are used here. It says all things were created by him, through him, and for him. It, it's, it's all inclusive. It's all about Jesus. He created everything. And then it begins to describe the things he created. It says everything in heaven and everything on earth, everything visible and everything invisible. And then he describes these four different uh, powers, if you will, everything uh, with um uh, it says whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, he's in charge of it all. Lots of reasons that Paul may have included this, but one of the reasons that Paul may have included this thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities is to let them know that in all things spiritual, that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are all above those things and those beings. He's saying there are no emanations or intermediaries of God. It, rather, the spiritual forces that are out there, the angelic beings that are out there, God, through Jesus, by Jesus, created all things. I want you to consider, I mentioned John chapter 1 a moment ago. I want you to hear what John chapter 1 verse 3 says about Jesus. It's a similar verse. It says, all things were made through him, Jesus, and without him, Jesus was not made anything that was made. We see here that these verses, as well as many other verses in Scripture, leaves no question that the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus is the agent of creation. But not only is he the agent of creation, he's actually the goal of creation, that all of creation is for him. I mean, you'll see that in verse 16, the last Two words of verse 16 says that these things were created for him. It's for his glory. You see, Jesus is God. He always has been God. There never was a time that he wasn't God. There was never a time he wasn't in existence because from eternity past, Jesus being a um, being in the Trinity, part of the triune God, has always and always will be God, and as such, he created everything. Now, I do want to address kind of what can be a tricky portion of this text, because uh, it, it actually has been twisted by many people to say things that it doesn't say. Look with me at verse 15. 
It describes Jesus as being the image of the invisible God, and then it uses an interesting phrase about him. It says he is the firstborn of all creation. What in the world does Paul mean, firstborn of all creation? Does this mean that Jesus was born? Absolutely not. But there have been those, and there are those who teach that false doctrine. You see, starting back as far back as the 4th century, there was a preacher by the name of Arius, A-R-I-U-S, Arius. And he began to teach a heresy that became known as Arianism, named after him. And Arius taught that verse 15 here in Colossians chapter 1 is teaching that Jesus was created. Now, the church as a whole realized that this was a heresy, and they fought against this heresy. In fact, there was a council or gathering of all the bishops or many of the bishops uh, in that part of the world that came together in a city called Nicaea, and there was a council of Nicaea that was uh, in, held in 325 AD. And as a result of that, they fought against this false heresy that Arius was teaching that Jesus was created, and they came up with what is known as the Nicene Creed. Perhaps you're familiar with it. It's an important creed for us to study and understand because it's pretty solid, biblically speaking, about uh, who God is and, and, and really unpacks who the Trinity is. But I wanted to pull one portion of the Nicene Creed out that kind of describes who Jesus is, and it, I believe, does a good job of trying to explain what is meant by the firstborn of all creation and all of this passage in Colossians 1. Here's what the Nicene Creed says about Jesus. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. Now, I know there were a lot of big words here, words we don't typically use, like constant, uh, consubstantial, I can't even say it. But I do want us to hear that it's describing Jesus as fully God. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, consubstantial, equal to, co-eternal, co-equal with the Father, and that all things were made by him and through him. Now, this false doctrine that Arius began in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the fourth century continues today. In fact, if you'll talk to any Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon, you'll begin to discover that neither the Mormons nor the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is fully God. In fact, they believe in a form of Arianism that Jesus is just some uh, spiritual being but not truly God. We cannot give in to this kind of heresy. Because if we don't understand who Jesus is, we're missing the whole point. So let's consider why the idea that verse 15 somehow teaches that Jesus was born or created, I should say, that Jesus was somehow created, that that is a heresy. The first reason we see this as a heresy is because of what we've been talking about already. Jesus is God. He created everything. So if he created everything, obviously he himself could not have been created. This word, firstborn, is in Greek, prototakis. It, it, it means existing before anything else was created. That's what its very definition or meaning or use of the word means. It points to Christ's supremacy over creation. It doesn't point to the fact that he was created himself. Now, in the ESV, in verse 15, it says that he is the firstborn of all creation, but just as many translations uses a different uh, word there, instead of saying that he was um, firstborn of all creation, it says firstborn over all creation. I believe that in our English thinking, the word over fits better here. Prepositions translate from Greek into English in a variety of ways, and depending on how you translate it, it could mean a couple of different words. I think the Greek word here better is uh, better understood by using the word over, meaning that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. That is a way to describe the fact that he is superior, that he is over, that he is superior over creation. He is creator, and that's what firstborn means here. 
Now, another reason understanding firstborn is meaning that he was somehow created as a heresy is what, what the rest of Scripture has to say about some of these things. Consider with me what Psalm 89 verse 27 says. In Psalm 89, 27, when it's written in the Greek, the same word, prototokos, that's used in Colossians is used also in Psalm 89. What you need to understand before I read Psalm 89 is that this psalm is written about King David. And I don't know if you remember the story when David was selected, but David was selected, uh, but he wasn't selected at first because he was not the oldest in his family. In fact, he was the youngest son of several sons of Jesse. And he was the youngest of them all. And yet we see in Psalm 89, verse 27, about David, God says, and I will make him, this time about David, I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Clearly, God is not saying that he's going to somehow make David now firstborn in his family. And yet the word firstborn is used there. In other words, Firstborn in scripture can be used in a figurative manner and usually is to refer to one who has been exalted to the highest place. And so with David, he was exalted to the highest place. As a result, when we see that word used in Colossians, we see that Jesus, because he is God and because he created everything, is exalted to the highest place. One last thing I want to point to you uh, out about this phrase, firstborn, over all or of all creation is this. Firstborn is a title that's often used for the Messiah. In fact, many would interpret Psalm 89, 27 to be, uh, uh, that whole chapter, to be, yes, about David, but also be pointing towards the Messiah and the one who would come in the line of David, that Jesus would be the king in the line of David. And so, therefore, firstborn of all creation does not indicate that Jesus was somehow created himself. Rather, it's a way to point to the fact that he is superior it points to the fact that he existed before everything else, and it points to the fact that uh, that he has the highest place and that he himself is the Messiah, that Jesus is the promised one. I want us to look at one other aspect as we consider this phrase, firstborn over all creation. Jesus clearly is not created. Look down in verse 17. The beginning of verse 17 says, and he, meaning Jesus, is before all things. He is before all things in time because he created everything else. So therefore he was before them. He's always been in existence. There was never a time that Jesus did not exist. Jesus has been in existence in the Son of God from eternity past. And because of that, he is before all things. And of course, before all things would also mean his primary importance above all things as well. So we see with Jesus that he is above everything because he is God and because he created everything. And then this brings us to the last point that points towards the fact that he is preeminent. And that is that he brings redemption. Look with me at verses 18 through 20. Look at what it says about Jesus here. It says, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn. There's that word first, first, first. Uh, firstborn again. He is the firstborn from the dead that in, in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So we see here, that just in this section, that just as Jesus is Lord over creation that we read about a moment ago, Jesus is also Lord over the new creation. We, we know that Paul in several places will refer to a new follower of Jesus or a Christian as one who is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. We've been made new in Jesus Christ. We've been redeemed by Jesus. We've been reconciled by him and we are a new creation. And so just as Jesus is Lord over the creation and the created order, he's also Lord over his new creation, followers of Jesus and his church. All of this is possible because of what it says about Jesus in verse 18, that he is the firstborn from the dead. What's that all about? It's pointing to Jesus' resurrection. 
Now, again, firstborn does not mean he's literally the first per person that resurrected from the dead because we see that Jesus uh, brought people back from the dead himself. We see it happen in the Old Testament some as well. We know that people have been resurrected in the past. However, none of those resurrections are possible without Jesus' resurrection. In fact, none of those other resurrections lasted. Those people still died again at some point in the future. But with Jesus, he is the epitome of resurrection. He is the resurrection the, the life uh, and the life. He died on the cross for our sins, was resurrected on the third day, and because of the power of his resurrection, we can experience resurrection as well. If you want to read more about this topic, you can go and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 sometime today that talks about resurrection, how resurrection is factual because Jesus is the first one or the real one who brings about resurrection. And in verse 20 in 1 Corinthians 15, it says that Christ raised from the dead the first fruits. He, he was the first fruits of the dead. He is the one, as the resurrection, he is the one who brings about resurrection in others. We also see in this passage that Jesus came in order to reconcile to himself all things. Look in verse 19 and 20. In 19, it says that the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, that, that all of God was in is in Jesus because he is God, and, and it was pleased to dwell there. And the pleasing to dwell carries on into verse 20, and that God is pleased because through Jesus, he is reconciling all things to himself. What, what does reconcile mean? Reconcile means to make things right with one another. And it says that we are reconciled by the blood of his cross. But there is a confusing aspect of this verse. It says that he reconciles all things to himself. So is this somehow teaching some sort of universalism where everybody can become Christians and, and, and that, that all folks will go to heaven anyway? Because is it meaning that every 100% of the people on the planet will be reconciled to God because it says all things? No, because the Bible is clear that not everyone will be reconciled. In fact, you keep reading through Colossians and you'll see that judgment is coming to those who don't trust in Jesus. And so what does Paul mean when he says that Jesus came to reconcile all things to himself? I believe that the word all here points to the comprehensive nature of God's uh, reconciliation through Jesus Christ. That, that it's not lacking at all, that Jesus' work on the cross and his burial and his resurrection is sufficient, and, and that, that it includes everything that was needed for reconciliation to take place. But also, I think there's this aspect of the word all in Scripture, sometimes meaning uh, all, all aspects of something, and yet not each and every individual one. What I mean by that is that all aspects of creation— are obviously touched by sin, and therefore all aspects of creation will be touched by grace. That doesn't mean that every single element will be redeemed or forgiven of their sins, that not every single person will trust in Jesus for salvation. But it does indicate that every category, if you will, of creation will be someday restored. In fact, if you'll keep reading through Revelation, you'll see that, that there's a new heaven and a new earth, and that, that Jesus, that God through Jesus will be restoring the creation one day. And if you'll read Romans chapter 8, it talks some of that about some of that as well. Now, I do want to clarify that, that, that I believe that this phrase, when it says that all things are being reconciled to himself through Jesus Christ, that, that that it means that ultimately, while not everyone will believe, ultimately all will submit to God. Consider the passage perhaps that you're familiar with, Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, that describes who Jesus is. And, and then it says, Therefore God has exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The day is coming that every single person will ultimately submit to Jesus, even if that means they submit to him while they are in, a, in an eternity called hell. That all people will ultimately recognize that Jesus is sovereign. Now, I want to spend just a moment talking about what reconciliation is all about. 
It says there in verse 20 that through Jesus, God is pleased to reconcile to himself all things. It says that he's making peace with us by the blood of his cross. To be reconciled means to be made right with one another. God has a desire that all people would be made right with him through the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ. As I said a moment ago, not all people will experience that, but God's desire is that folks would trust in Jesus and that by that, that we would be reconciled to him. Why do we need to be reconciled to God? Reconciliation indicates that there is a, 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 a faction or a division or a disagreement, if you will. The Bible is clear that all of us are sinners and that because of our sin, that we are ultimately always forever separated from God, that our sin separates us from God. The Bible indicates that the wages or the results of our sin is death and that we will experience both physical death and spiritual death and ultimately forever separation from a good and holy God. And yet, God made a plan. And that plan was to use his son, Jesus Christ, who is above all things, to send him to this earth, that he would live on this planet like you and I, that Jesus would not give in to sin, that he would not uh, commit sin of any sort or fashion, and that he would still willingly go and die on the cross for our sins. You see, the reason that Jesus came was not only to reveal God to us, but also to give us an opportunity to be reconciled to God, to experience peace with God that comes only through the blood of the cross. The Bible says that if we'll turn to Jesus in faith, trusting that he is the way for salvation and that there's nothing we can do on our own, if we'll turn to Jesus in in repentance or for asking for forgiveness of our sins, that we can be made right with him again. And that this pleases God, that Jesus came on a rescue mission, that we might be reconciled to him. And you see, it's on the basis of everything we've looked at this morning, from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, that Jesus has first place in all things. He's God, he's creator, he's redeemer, and therefore, by his very definition, he has first things in all, first place, I'm sorry, in all things. My question for you is there at the bottom of the sermon notes. The question is, but does God, or does Jesus, I should say, does Jesus have first place in your life? I would encourage all of us to acknowledge and submit to the fact that Jesus is first. And because he's first, we should acknowledge that fact in our lives, in our families, He's first in our families. He's first in our marriages. He's first in our jobs. He's first in mission and ministry. He's first in how we spend our time. He's first in how things, the things that we do. He's first in what we watch on television, what we do on the internet. He's first in our worship. He's first in our life. He's first, whether we acknowledge that or not. But my question is, are you living your life in such a way that is a reflection that he is above all things? You know, as I've read this text and I've thought about it this week. It's reminded me of just how important it is for us to rightly understand God. For us to understand God, we must seek him. We must seek to understand him and study him through his word. His word is his revelation to us. Jesus is the ultimate revelation, and then he has the written word, the Bible, for us to study to understand who Jesus is. All of this could be described as theology. Theology is the study of God through his word. And correct theology really, really matters. Because what was going on in Colossae and what was going on with Arius that I talked about in the 4th century and what's going on in the Mormon church or the Jehovah's Witness church or a lot of other places is an incorrect understanding of who God is, an incorrect theology. It's a 
false theology, a false doctrine, a heresy. We must never give in to these false teachings, but in order for us to avoid false teachings, we must study God, we must study his word, we must understand theology, we must understand who God is. And all of that will lead us to a correct doctrine, a doctrine that we can teach to others and pass on to others, that we can pour into our own children and to our our spouses and to our friends and to those in our D groups and to those in our hope groups that we're passing on correct doctrine instead of false doctrine. As we've seen this morning, the foundation of correct doctrine is Jesus Christ himself. And we cannot have Christian principles in our lives and in our nation and in our families and in our church without first knowing Jesus Christ himself. But I would encourage you, don't just stop there. Don't just gain knowledge, which we must, from God's word and from studying scripture and studying theology and understanding doctrine. Don't stop there, but go out and now live this correct doctrine so that our understanding of who Jesus is impacts our daily lives as we live out our lives. When we do all of this, then we're going to see that the supremacy of Christ The fact that Jesus is first place in all things brings the answer to everything else in life. Whether it be wars and factions, racism or starvation or illiteracy or relationship issues or crime problems or or whatever financial issues, whatever's going on in your life. When we see that Jesus is first in all things, then he begins to bring the answer to those things we're facing. You see, since Jesus is God, since Jesus is creator, since Jesus is redeemer, he is supreme and above everything else. So if Jesus is all of those things, if he's able to handle creation, if he's able to handle reconciliation, which he is more than capable because he is fully God, if he truly is supreme and above all things, then I encourage you this morning to trust in him in whatever situation you're facing. Because you see, he's above it all, and he's going to guide you. It's interesting, as I prepared this this week, I didn't know I would end up being in quarantine for COVID uh, possibilities and things like that. But I've been reminded by this text that regardless of what's going on with my physical health or anything else, that I can and should and must continue to trust Jesus Christ because he is fully God, he is creator, he is redeemer, he is above all, and he will guide me through this situation and he will guide you through whatever situation you're facing in life as well. He is good, let's trust him. Now this morning, we're gonna continue our time of worship in just a moment uh, with singing and one of our pastors will lead us through a time of response and then ultimately we'll experience the Lord's Supper together. But I wanna lead us in prayer as we continue to worship together as a church family. God, we thank you. We thank you that you sent your son Jesus who is fully God from eternity past into eternity future. And that because he is preeminent in all things in life, I can trust him with my very life. This morning, God, I pray for those who don't know you as Savior, that they would trust in you. For those that are struggling with difficulties going on in their life, that they would say yes to you and trust you, that you are bigger and greater than anything we face in life. God, may you be glorified and honored through our lives this morning and through this week. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So now we have a time of response, a time for you to have an opportunity to do some business with God. Hopefully, as you've listened and learned today, God's been speaking to you in your heart. Uh, But maybe this is a moment where you need to to do some business with him, like I said, and come up to the altar and and, uh, lay something there and say, God, you're God, and you're God over this, so I'm going to put my faith and trust in you. David and I will be up here if there's somebody you you need somebody to pray with you or or, uh, just intercede with you for a situation in your life, come up and, and we'll pray with you. But whatever we do right now, my heart is for you that you would deal with God, that you would talk to him and hear his heart on whatever's going on in your life. This is not a song we have sung before. So I'm just going to ask you to just stay seated and let God deal with you as we sing the song over you. Uh, If you know it, sing it with us. If you don't, listen to the words and let God speak to you through them. Firstborn over all creation, far beyond imagination, all. Vi-
visible and invisible things bow before Christ our King the Godhead dwelling fully in him yet crucified for our salvation so incredible indescribable God Jesus Christ Lord of all Holy Holy God's children singing Holy Nothing left to say but Holy Your voice 
voices. Holy, all God's children sing. Holy, nothing left to say but holy. Oh. Amen. That's such a, a good message and a good song for transitioning into the Lord's Supper this morning. And so we're going to be doing, I want to give you a few instructions before we get there, though. First of all, parents, if you have children that are up in Fusion or over in the children's worship area that have professed faith in Christ and you would like for them to participate in the Lord's Supper with us, you please, we want you to go get them right now. We're going to give you enough time to be able to do that. If that's what you would like to do, we want to invite them to join us. And also, do you want someone to go get your? Uh, yeah, Peter, be great. Someone grab Howard, Peter. Howard can, uh, he, said, he said he would uh, take care of that. As they are going to get the uh, children to come and join us in participating in this, there's tables in the four corners of the, the uh, building in here. And so we're going to take a time. The scriptures tell us that uh, uh, Paul told the church in Corinth that he wanted the church there to take time before they actually take the Lord's Supper to examine themselves. And we want to take some time to examine ourselves. We know we've just had a time of response and all that, but this is a, a time where we examine ourselves before we take the supper, not only to make sure everything is good between me and God, but to make sure everything is good between me and my church. And so as we sit down and think through and pray and let God speak to us, we're gonna, uh, I want you to get yourself in a place where you're ready to take the Lord's Supper. As we do, when you are ready, after a few moments, please come up and you'll be able to pick up a cup for however many people that are with you. Inside these cups, there's a, a wafer inside here as well as the juice. And so you'll just take those back to your seat and hold on to those until we are ready to take it together. There's also a plate with... Uh, I forgot what they call that. Gluten-free, that's what it is. Uh, there's a plate with gluten-free option for the cracker there on each of the uh, trays, on the tables there. So uh, have I forgotten anything? I don't think so. Uh, Eric and them are going to be playing uh, some song to help us kind of get to that place. So I want you to just take some time to reflect, to prepare your hearts, and then when everyone has had a time, chance to come up and get those elements that then go back to your seat then we will take the Lord's Supper together okay
if you haven't had a chance to get anything, you want to go ahead and do that now. Paul, when he wrote to the church in Corinth, he said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so on your cup here, on the bottom part, you'll see, make sure you open up the right side where the cracker is. Go ahead and open that up and take the bread. And remember, as we do this, we're doing this in remembrance of him, okay? Do not do this light, slightly. Do not take this for granted. Do this in remembrance of what he did for us. And if you'll open up your juice... And he said, uh, this cup is the new covenant in his blood. Every time we do this, we do this in remembrance of him. Take and drink. Father, we are grateful for the great love that you have shown us. Help us to walk in a way that is worthy of your great love and to not take what you have given us, what you have done for us, and what you have called us to do. Help us not to take that for granted. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, Nathan? Yeah. Hey, let's pray again. <clears throat> Father, we love you so much. Father, I thank you for the message from Alan this morning, Lord. Father, I thank you that you came, you sent your son in human form to earth, Lord. Father, I pray that we would live out the practical implications of that, Lord, this week, Lord. Father, make it real in our lives. Father, it says in Romans, Lord, that just as sin entered the world through one man, that, Father, by the one man, the God-man, Jesus Christ, sin and death has been put to death. So, Father, I pray that it would be real. Father, I pray for those in this room for who it is not real, Lord, that, Father, by your spirit, you would quicken the truth of the word that was spoken today in their hearts. And that we would know that Jesus is God and he has paid the price. We love you, Lord. I thank you for every soul in this room, Lord. May they know the deep love that you have for them, Lord. And Father, may the sacrifice that Jesus made be real, Lord. That, Father, there is now no therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that by Jesus we have peace with you. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs> I'm supposed to dismiss. We love y'all. Have a great week. <laughs> That's what happens when they give me a mic.
is and done.